Hello and welcome to the graduate course ECE 254B, uh, Advanced Computer Architecture Parallel Processing. So the, the subject of the course is parallel processing and originally it was part of a three course sequence uh, entitled Advanced Computer Architecture. That's where the name 254B comes from was the middle course in that three course sequence but the other two courses in the sequence have been discontinued so but the, this course has kept its original name ECE 254B. I'll be teaching this course based on my own book whose cover image you see on this title slide for my presentation. Uh, it has six parts each part consisting of four chapters. Now, I've recently modified the book to contain seven parts. So part two has been divided into parts two prime and two double prime. And I've kept the original numbering so that you can follow the material more easily from the textbook. So part two has now become part two and part three, and then parts three through six become parts four through seven, but I've not renumbered the parts yet. Uh, I'll eventually do it when I use the next edition of my uh, textbook, but for now, we'll keep the original numbering. We'll call the two parts uh, coming from the original part two, part two prime and to double prime. And we also keep the original chapter numbering. Um, so the book has been written so that uh, each chapter corresponds to a lecture. So it's short enough to be covered in a single lecture. However, given that we have only 10 weeks and there are a couple of holidays also in, in these 10 weeks, we can't really devote uh, one lecture to each chapter. So what I have been doing in recent years um, when teaching this course is to drop a few chapters from the end of the textbook and occasionally combine two chapters into a single lecture. Uh, so basically uh, reduce the coverage a little bit. And these two chapters that are combined are usually the last two chapters in a part. So for example, we'll have lecture one today, which is introduction to parallelism, chapter one. And then lecture two will be a taste of parallel algorithms, chapter two. And then lecture three will be a combination of chapters three and four. And I've done this uh, in order to be able to cover the most important material in the textbook in the course of one 10-week quarter. Okay. Uh, this is a disclaimer that comes at the beginning of uh, all my presentations uh, about uh, how people can use or cannot use these presentations. And then there's also a record of revisions. Uh, you see there have been a lot of revisions. Uh, this particular presentation was released in 2005 and then has been revised every uh, couple of years, uh, recently every year. Uh, and the current form, winter 2021, is what you see here. Now these presentations, uh, I'll mention how you can get them. Uh, there are two web pages that you will need to consult in the course of the quarter. Uh, one web page you see on the left, uh, at the left of this slide, is the textbooks page. And the other one you see on the right is the courses web page. Now, what you get from the textbooks web page, in addition to general information about the textbook and also a list of discovered errors in the textbook. Uh, so uh, make sure you consult the section list of errors uh, to be able to correct all the errors in the textbook. Um, these errors, of course, will be corrected in the next edition. 
of the book. Uh, other than that, you also get the lecture slides for the six parts, or actually seven parts, now that we have parts two prime and two double prime. So each part is a separate presentation, separate slideshow, and you can get those from this web page. And then where you see we have the PowerPoint version of the presentation as well as the PDF version. Uh, the PDF version is usually uh, easier to get, uh, fewer compatibility problems, and it doesn't make much difference in this course. Uh, I don't use any animations in my slides for this course. So you can get the PDF version. It's both smaller in size and also less likely to cause compatibility problems. And then next to these uh, links to PowerPoint and PDF, uh, you see the last update date. And I'm going to update all these presentations this year. So please wait until you see a 2021 date in front of those before you download the presentations in order to make sure you get the most up-to-date version. And also the slide numbers will be the same as the ones I use in the course. So if you have any questions, for example, you want to ask me uh, about uh, difficulty you had in say slide number 25, if you, update, if you download the most updated version, then our slide numbers will match. Okay, so make sure to get the most up-to-date version. And then the courses webpage basically lists the requirements. Uh, this quarter, uh, winter 2021, there will be two components to the evaluation for the course. 40% uh, is uh, comes from uh, homeworks. There will be five homework assignments. Uh, and these are listed in the course schedule, course calendar. So if you look at the course calendar, right below what you see here on this slide is a lecture by lecture outline of what will be covered that lecture and when homework assignments will be released, will be available, and when they will be due. There's also a 60% component that comes from research. There will be no exams for this particular course in this quarter. And the research also has various milestones and deadlines, including deadline for selecting your topic, deadline for turning in your preliminary references, and all, all of those are listed under course calendar. So that's the first thing I urge you to consult and enter homework due dates, uh, various research due dates on your personal calendar so that you can work on these uh, uh, and not uh, brisk missing any deadlines. Uh, I have a policy of not extending any deadlines because I give you the deadlines way ahead of time at the beginning of the quarter. And in the case of homeworks, uh, I will be giving you solutions uh, shortly after the due date, so I can't extend it for that reason as well because solutions will have been made available to students and therefore it doesn't make sense to extend the deadline. So just try to start work early. Uh, for each homework, you will have at least nine days to do it. So start early so that if you have any problems or conflicts uh, near the end of that period for that homework, uh, they don't cause you to miss the deadline. Okay, uh, this course announcement section is where you see uh, everything that is new about the course, all the things, so you don't have to scan the entire page to see what's new. All the new things, the new homework was posted, you know, a change was made or whatever, you will see it in the course announcement section. I will also send to all students in the course at least weekly uh, messages 
uh, to sort of uh, give you a heads up about up upcoming deadlines, availability of lectures, uh, homeworks, and so on. So there are two mechanisms for our communication. One is through you reading the, through these course assignments, cor course announcements, sorry, course announcements in the course webpage, and also the emails that will come to you through Gaucho Space. Okay, so let's get started uh, on part one in the textbook, which consists of four chapters. Today we will cover chapter one, Introduction to Parallelism. It basically gives us uh, some basic uh, uh, terminology and ideas about what parallel processing is, why it is important, and uh, other things that we need to know in order to understand the rest of the course. Uh, chapter two, A Taste of Parallel Algorithms, basically a grand tour of the entire textbook by giving you a taste for what will be coming in future chapters. So it's good in the sense that it prepares you for what will be coming and also will tell you, you know, the kinds of things that we'll be doing in this course. Uh, chapter three, parallel algorithm complexity will give us tools for evaluating algorithm complexity in terms of running time and uh, uh, other properties of the algorithm. And chapter four, models of parallel processing, which I will cover very briefly because I'll be combining that with chapter three into a single lecture. Okay, so in this uh, first chapter, which I will cover in this lecture, we set the stage for presenting the course material, including Challenges in designing and using parallel systems. Why is the subject matter difficult and challenging? And metrics to evaluate the effectiveness of parallelism so that once we develop a parallel solution, we are prepared, we are equipped to evaluate the effectiveness. How well we did, how much speed up we achieved uh, over conventional non-parallel solution. Okay. So these are the resources that uh, are available to us. Uh, our textbook, which is a required textbook because uh, among other things, uh, the problems that I will assign to you will come from the textbook. We'll follow it closely in terms of the structure of the course. Uh, it's my own book, Introduction to Parallel Processing, Algorithms, and Architectures. So that title basically sort of specifies our focus. We are focusing on algorithms, architectures, and the interplay between the two. Um, we have a recommended book. Uh, this, this one you are not required to purchase or study, but it's useful in the sense that it covers complementary software topics. Uh, our course has a hardware orientation because I am a hardware uh, computer architecture person. And so my view of the field of parallel processing is hardware uh, focused. So if you want to learn more about software topics, this book by Rober and Runger Parallel Programming for Multicore and Cluster Systems is a good uh, supplement if you want to learn those topics. As I said, it's not a required book. Then there's a free online book. I've given the link here uh, by Matloff, uh, Programming and Parallel Machines, GPU, Multicore, Cluster, and more. Uh, it's a PDF file that is available online, free. And then there is this fourth item, a useful online course uh, sponsored by NVIDIA. NVIDIA is one of the major players nowadays in uh, parallel processing architectures. And the course is entitled Introduction to Parallel Programming. It's also a free course. Uh, CPU, GPU, CUDA. CUDA is a language, uh, that's an abbreviation that stands for Complete Unified uh, Device Architecture. 
Uh, so it's a language that allows you to write parallel programs to run on um, combination of CPU, GPU systems. So if you have time, that, that's a very uh, good course to take. It's time well spent. It gives you some uh, uh, basically insights into how modern parallel uh, architectures are programmed to run actual applications. So why parallel processing? Okay, this uh, diagram is from the textbook uh, up to 2010. Uh, the textbook, as I mentioned, was written in 1999. So uh, various processor uh, products, CPU products, up to Pentium, Pentium 2, and R10,000 are plotted. It shows the basically the trend in improved performance up to this point that was available and then projection into the future up to around 2010. And performance is measured in instructions per second, how many instructions per second are executed, and then the units are million instruction per second, billion instruction per second, and then trillion instruction per second. Mega IPS, Giga IPS, and Tera IPS. And this is logarithmic scale. OK, well, this prediction was pretty accurate up to about 2005, when suddenly the rate of increase in process of performance dropped and this dash line is basically the projection from 2012 so people lowered the projection rate uh, the performance rate increase uh, to this line and this line has basically held up quite well up to today so you might ask why this drop okay I'll show you some other charts that explain this. And then simultaneously with that, because the performance increase dropped for a single processor, people started using multiprocessors or multiple cores on the same chip. So that by 2010, we are up to about 100 cores. This is an approximate number, OK? So dozens of core per chip. So instead of building one giant complicated processor with increased performance, we build a large number of simpler processors on the same chip. So the performance improvement that we lost, for the reasons that will become clear in a minute, were made up for in terms of increased number of processors. OK, some uh, slides I'm going to skip in the interest of time. This is an interesting slide to look at. Also, the source for it is given here if you, can, if you want to pursue uh, the ideas that are reflected in this slide. So this basically relates the processor performance as it increases to various levels of performance required to emulate uh, brains of various uh, uh, animals, okay, from very low intelligence uh, organisms all the way up to humans. And we are getting to the point where human brain, the, the capacity of human brain can be matched, computational capacity can be matched by uh, future. Uh, uh, parallel processing architecture, maybe around 2030 or so. OK, this semiconductor technology roadmap is something that uh, has been produced regularly uh, to tell us where semiconductor technology is headed. So this table originally was from the 2001 edition of this roadmap. 
that predicted what would happen to semiconductors in 2004, 2007, and so on. So those are the numbers. Okay, it turned out that these predictions were not quite matched. So for example, the prediction in 2001 was in 2010 to have a 12 gigahertz clock frequency. That didn't materialize. Uh, instead, the actual clock frequency was around 3.6, let's say 3 or 4 uh, gigahertz. And similarly, in 2016, the clock frequency of 30 gigahertz did not materialize. Instead, we had around 4 or 5 gigahertz. Okay, again, I'll mention why this change happened. Now, in 2011, these predictions were updated. The second, second table to the right are those updated predictions. And it says, for example, in 2015, the half pitch, which is an indicator for density of semiconductor circuit, would be 19. And that was actually better than what was predicted for 2016. So in, in some cases, the predictions were too conservative. So that, for example, in 2016, we expected to have a half pitch of 22 nanometers based on the old prediction, whereas in 2015, we actually had a smaller number than that. And in 2020, it was 12 nanometer. OK, however, as I mentioned, clock frequency did not increase as much as expected. And this updated uh, projection basically shows that. OK, and that's uh, enough about this slide. Now, this is a trans in processor chip density, performance, clock speed, power, and number of cores. You see that density improvement has continued unimpeded up to 2010. So this is from a 2011 report by NASA National Research Council. Actually, I have an updated version of this. Let me go directly to that one. That goes to 2020. It includes that diagram, uh, but also extended in this article to 2020. So you see that density in terms of number of transistors on the chip has basically continued the exponential growth. This is exponential because the uh, a straight line, because of this logarithmic scale, represents an exponential growth. OK, performance, however, flattened since about 2005. Frequency clock frequency flattened. Typical power consumption also flattened. In fact, the power consumption was the main culprit. You know, the power consumption was growing so quickly that these chips lost their ability, or designers of chips lost the ability to get rid of the heat generated on the chip, and therefore they had to sort of uh, reduce the rate of growth in power consumption because the you know a modern chip in those days in 2005 used about 100 watts of power and then that was about the maximum maybe we could go to 200 maybe 250 and still be able to dispose of the heat but beyond that it would be impossible so if we continued the power growth and frequency growth. And frequency is actually what uh, consumes that power. The higher frequency means higher power consumption. And therefore, the flattening of these two was because we simply had reached the end of our ability to get rid of this extensive uh, power that was dissipated 
and had to be removed in the form of heat from the IC chip. And to make up for that performance loss, or it was not actually a loss, but loss of growth performance, which we had come to expect, uh, more cores or more processor cores were incorporated into each chip. And therefore, the performance growth was maintained, even though the performance of single processor uh, started to flatten since 2005. Okay, this uh, diagram is interesting because it shows the impact of technology improvement and architectural innovations in the growth of performance for microprocessors. What it basically says in very simple terms is that in the course of uh, from 1985 to 2010, uh, Technology, so the blue dots are basically the impacts of technology, gate speed improvement, F04 means fan out of four, uh, an inverter with a fan out of four will exhibit this speed. And this accounts for a factor of about 100 in performance improvement. In other words, if we took the architectures of 1985, and simply implemented them with this faster, faster technology, we would see a performance improvement of about 100. Another factor of about 100, not quite 100, a little bit less, was due to architectural improvement. So the total improvement is about 10,000, a factor of 100 due to technology improvement, a factor of 100 due to architectural innovations. And the rate of this architectural innovation, the slope of this curve that you see here, was greatest uh, in the period 1995 to 2000, where much of that improvement was achieved. There has been some improvement since then, but not as much. Okay, so the extreme performance that we see in modern processors is due to two factors. Half of that improvement comes from technological improvement, faster circuit, and another half comes from architectural ideas, innovations. Okay, why do we need high performance computing? Well, here I've uh, listed three reasons. First of all, achieve higher speed. So we do have uh, scientific uh, modeling problems, particularly in physics, that take weeks and sometimes even months to run on the fastest available computers. So it would be nice if we can run these instead of weeks or months in hours or days. So higher speed helps us do that. So an example I cite here is that 24-hour weather forecast well, if the program that does that forecast runs for 24 hours, then the output will be useless. But if it runs in an hour, then the output will be useful because we still have 23 hours to go in that 24-hour period. Higher throughput basically means solving more problems. Uh, and this comes into play in uh, what we call transaction processing systems. So a bank computer, for example, does a lot of transactions. Each transaction does not require a lot of compute power. A user, for example, deposits money into an account. That's a transaction that needs to be performed. Withdraws cash from ATM and so on. So the transactions are simple, but there are very many of them. Another example of transaction processing is in sites like Amazon.com where people shop. Again, each transaction is not uh, very complicated. You choose a few products and then put them in the shopping cart and then check out. But there are very many of these transactions in the course of an hour or a day. 
So we need compute power to be able to perform all of these transactions um, while providing a reasonable response time for each transaction. So that's the second reason. The third reason is that just having the higher com computational power will make us think of solving larger problems. So if we did 24-hour weather prediction before, we may think, OK, let's do weekly weather prediction or predict the weather for a month or even go to climate prediction where we try to predict climate uh, decades from today. Well, the further the prediction goes, the more processing is involved, the more data needs to be collected. And therefore, higher computational power not only allows us to solve existing problems faster, as in part one, or do more transactions, simple problems, but many of them at the same time, but also allow us to solve larger problems that we don't even consider now. They're just too complicated for today's computers. But if we increase the computational power of our computers by a factor of 1,000, then uh, a lot more problems become solvable. We can entertain uh, the idea of solving bigger problems. OK, supercomputers that we use today fall into various categories. Uniprocessors, uh, also known as vector machines, these are becoming increasingly uh, rarer. In other words, even vector computers come in multiprocessor configurations nowadays. So uniprocessor basically means build a very powerful processor, the single one, that has high performance. And this is done through vector processing. We'll talk about that later. Uh, multiprocessors use uh, centralized or distributed shared memory. So we have a large number of processors. They access a shared memory that is centralized or distributed and basically collaborate on solving a large problem through sharing data in the shared memory. A multi-computer is basically a bunch of more or less independent computers, each of which is running its own program, but occasionally communicate uh, through message passing in order to coordinate their actions. And uh, the last two categories uh, can be massively parallel. And informally, a massively parallel computer is one that has more than 1,000 processors. This is just you know, an arbitrary threshold that has been chosen. So when we, when we talk about massively parallel processors, or MPPs, we are talking about systems that have a 1,000 or more processors. The most powerful computers nowadays have many millions of processors. Actually, we have just broken uh, the, um, the ceiling of about 20 million, or uh, even close to 30 million processors in one computer system. OK, one of the things that um, is sometimes uh, advanced and has a difficulty of parallel processing is the speed of light argument. So what is the speed of light argument? Well, the speed of light is about 30 centimeters per nanosecond. That's about a foot per nanosecond. So. Light travels in one nanosecond about this distance of what? OK. Why is that important? Well, if signals must travel, so signals travel at the speed that is a fraction of the speed of light. If signals must travel one and a half centimeters during the execution of an instruction, that instruction will take at least 0.1 nanosecond. So I'm taking here the signals, signal speed to be about half the speed of light, 15 centimeters per nanosecond. So 1.5 centimeters is 0.1 nanosecond. So if one instruction requires 0.1 nanosecond because of this speed of light limitation, 
performance will be limited to 10 billion instructions per second. Okay, so obviously this is uh, an argument that says speed of light limits performance. The thing is, uh, the key observation is that if signals must travel a distance, nowadays we can design computers so that signals do not have to travel that far to execute every instruction. And therefore we can easily overcome this uh, limit or barrier of 10 billion instructions per second. In fact, the fastest supercomputers nowadays are approaching about 10 to the 12 instructions per second. That's about a million uh, so giga instruction per second is 10 to the 9 Uh, and 10 times that is 10 to the 10. 10 to the 10. Uh, sorry, nowadays we can do uh, exaflops, almost, not quite there yet, but exaflops is 10 to the 18 instructions per second. So from 10 to the 10, which is here, 10 to the 18 is a big space. How did we manage to, to do that, it's because we sort of limit communications across long distances in these uh, highly parallel computers. So as uh, processors become more dense, miniaturized, distances basically shrink. So this one and a half centimeter <coughs> Excuse me. There's no longer a limitation. Distances are much shorter. And also ideas such as cache memory, which brings data very close to the processor. Uh, the distance being a fraction of a millimeters rather than a few centimeters. So all of those contribute to us being overcome this objection represented in the speed of light argument. Okay, these I'm going to let you read on your own. Some interesting codes about parallel processing. Now, high-performance computing today faces three what we call walls or obstacles or barriers to improved performance. These are the memory wall, the power wall, and the reliability wall. The first two are well known. The reliability wall is lesser known. So let me explain what these are. A memory wall basically says, even in a single processor system, the performance of memory, the bandwidth, the speed with which we can get that data is a limiting factor. In other words, if memory latency and memory bandwidth limits uh, did not exist, processors could run programs much faster than we can do now. So memory is basically slowing down the processor. Now, if it slows down a single processor, imagine how much worse that becomes if you try to share that memory between hundreds, thousands, or millions of processors. You need some way of removing this obstacle, this barrier, because a memory that serves many processors will be even uh, slower because it, it's trying to satisfy the demands of more processors, more memory accesses, and so on. We'll see how this memory challenge is solved, at least in part. Okay, the power wall is similar. You know, the largest supercomputers of maybe a decade ago were already exceeding a megawatt of power consumption. much more than a megawatt, maybe 10 megawatts. And that meant that the, there's so much power required that they had to build a power generation facility right next to, next door to the supercomputer in order to supply it with the required power. Not only that, but getting rid of the heat that 
consuming so much power generated was a major problem. So very sophisticated cooling systems were required to get rid of that heat. And if we were to just continue, so a decade ago we were talking about uh, petaflops of performance, 10 to the 15 uh, operations per second. We are now talking about 10 to the 18. So a factor of 1,000 means the megawatts will now go to gigawatts. So people started basically thinking of ways of reducing the power consumption using low power, lower power designs. And that's the sense in which power was a wall that had to be overcome. You know, it was a barrier on our path to higher performance. Now, reliability wall challenge, as I said, is lesser known. It basically means now that we have millions of processors working together in a high performance computer, well, once you have each of these processors can be pretty reliable. But when you have millions of them, then it's extremely likely that one, two, or three of them will fail in the course of their operations. So if the computer is not specifically designed to be tolerant of such uh, you know, isolated processor failures, it would never get anything done. Okay, so reliability wall means that this reliability is an obstacle, a barrier along the path of achieving even higher performance. Yeah, of course, we have to solve all these three problems, overcome all the three barriers in order to go to higher and higher performance. So this is the power dissipation challenge illustrated in the graph. Okay, there is this law called, you, you have all heard of Moore's law about the increase in density of semiconductor chips. Kumi's law basically also predicts or suggests exponential improvement in energy efficient computing, uh, which is measured in terms of computations performed per kilowatt hours. And these computations, according to Kumi's law, double every 1.6 years or so. As you see in the diagram, that straight line again is an exponential growth of energy efficiency uh, of computers because the vertical axis is uh, logarithmic. So computations per kilowatt hour is on the vertical axis. And then the year up to 2010, I couldn't find a more up-to-date version of this diagram, but it does show the exponential trend in energy efficiency. So that's one of the things that will save us from the obstacle posed by the power wall. We can design more and more energy efficient uh, computers or processors. Now, another natural question at the start of this path towards studying high performance computing, why do we even need such high performance? Petaflops, which we are using, or exaflops that we are aiming for. Uh, flops, by the way, is floating point operations per second. That's a unit that is used because most of these compute intensive applications do floating point computations, most of these models. And therefore, the number of floating point operations per second, flops, is uh, important, is a measure of performance. Uh, there's also tips, para instructions per second, which is similar. Instead of floating point operations, we measure the rate of instruction execution. Both floating point, non-floating point arithmetic, control instructions, and so on. Okay, if we take reasonable running time for a program to be a fraction of an hour to several hours, if you run a program and it takes maybe four or five hours, that may be reasonable for depending on the application. If it's a few minutes, then it's definitely very reasonable. 
In this time frame, a teraflops machine can perform 10 to the 15 to 10 to the 16 operation, depending on whether we take a fraction of an hour to several hours. So where do we need this many operations, 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16? Here are three examples and uh, another one at the bottom. Uh, so I'll explain the first one in detail and also make a mention of the last one. Uh, this is a modeling application, Southern Oceans Heat Modeling. The Southern Oceans are basically oceans that are in the southern part uh, of our globe, of Earth. Uh, in this particular model, this is from a couple of decades ago, now the models have improved, um, divides this region of Southern Oceans into 4,096 east-west regions, 1,024 north-south regions, so this dimension is smaller, and then 12 layers in depth because ocean temperature will be different at different depths. So 12 layers in depth is an approximation because temperature will change quite a bit if you go maybe just two meters down. Uh, but we just allow 12 layers and take an approximate temperature for each of these layers. Okay, and then the computation shows if we have 10 minute iterations and each iteration takes 300 gigaflops. And if we have to perform 300,000 iterations for six years, suppose we want to predict these temperatures over a six year period, we need 10 to the 16 floating point operations. So this is an example of an application that needs 10 to the 16 operations. And therefore, if you run it on a teraflops machine, it will take several hours to complete, which is reasonable because typically when we run such models and we get some results, we may go back and fine tune the model. Um, if there are problems in the predictions and so on, we may have to run it many, many times before we get satisfactory answers, correct answers. So several hours may be acceptable. So maybe you let your program run overnight and then the next morning come and examine the outcome and then if you need to fine tune the model you work on it during the day. Okay, so the second example also leads to 10 to the 16. The third example leads to 10 to the 15. So that amount of computation is really something that is needed for real application. Now if I increase uh, the number of divisions by a factor of 1,000 so that I have finer divisions and therefore a finer model, better prediction, and I also increase this by 1,000 and also increase the depth, number of layers from 12 to maybe 120 or 10, 10 times 10 times 10, then I need a 1,000 times more so that instead of teraflops, I would need petaflops for, for the same application. Now, a good uh, example, this is not a very useful application in the sense of solving real world problems, but finding the largest prime has always been an obsession for mathematicians and others. Uh, there's a web page where you know, they keep track of the largest prime discovered so far. And I checked that uh, a couple of days ago and found out that the largest prime discovered is 2 to the power 82,589,933 minus 1, which is a Mersenne prime. Okay, so that's the largest uh, prime known to us as of January 20, as of this month. This number has more than 24,000 digits in this decimal representation. So once in a while, as computational power increases, people can sort of explore larger and larger numbers. And this largest prime has always, almost always has, has been a Mersenne prime. 
So that we can find the next Mersenne prime requires more computational power. Now this uh, chart is outdated, uh, basically shows um, the growth of performance in the supercomputers of the 1980s to the year 2000, this black line. The fact that it was growing like that didn't mean that we could not build actually higher performance computers. And uh, Gordon Bell in, in the paper predicted that the reason we are not building these higher performance computers is money. Basically, these largest supercomputers that are commercially viable have always cost around maybe one to five million dollars. That's the money that the biggest users of computers are willing to pay for such machines. If we were willing to spend $30 million on a machine, we could, with the technology available to us in 1990s, actually achieve teraflops computing and exceed it. And uh, if we were willing to spend $240 million, these are large sums of money that nobody actually was willing to pay, uh, we could increase the performance even further. So one reason we are not building computers that are higher performing than the, the best we have today is the cost. We are waiting for the cost to come down so that we can go to higher performance computers. This one I'm going to skip. It's outdated already. OK, there is a site called the Top 500. Uh, site uh, top just if you just Google type top 500 uh, it keeps track of the 500 most powerful computers on earth and over time uh, I've included slides here this is from 2005 the top three computers were these so I've not deleted these slides so that because they give you sort of an image of how things have changed over time uh, this one's from 2008, this one's from 2012, this one's from 2018, and the latest version of this uh, from November, uh, so this is this list is published twice a year, the second one is November. Okay, so this is the latest data available, and these are the top five supercomputers in the world in terms of performance. Okay, top one, Fugaku, has a peak performance of 537 petaflops. So this is about half of exaflops, okay? The next one after that is only 200 petaflops, so there's a big difference between these two. And the second one used to be ranked one in the previous ranking, it went down. Uh, the third one used to be ranked second, and so on. And the last one used to be ranked seven, it moved up a couple of notches to rank five. And this is a supercomputer by NVIDIA. NVIDIA, by virtue of its GPU, chips is now a major player in building supercomputers and therefore this seems that the approach of NVIDIA is promising because it's moving up in the ranking. Okay, so some other information. This table is actually wider. I've truncated it to fit on the slide. If you go to the top 500 uh, supercomputer sites, you can see the rest of the story in this table. But this one does not use any GPUs or other accelerators. Whereas, and this one doesn't use, but the other ones use. The interconnect technology used between processors is mentioned here. 
InfiniBand is a, st is a standard interconnect that these two are using. And the other ones are using, uh, and this one is also using InfiniBand, but the other two are using custom interconnect that they have designed. And CPU cores, so now this here, this is a 159,000 chips, each of which has 48 cores. So that's the total number of cores running at 2.2 gigahertz. This one does 3 gigahertz. This one 3.1 gigahertz. And so on. Okay, so let's see which one has the most. I guess this top one has the most cores because this is, let's say, 80,000 times 80,000 times 100, 8 million, 8 million cores are being utilized in this architecture. Okay, so this is just to give you a picture of where things stand. Uh, so over time, we have uh, sort of tried to set milestones for performance. Uh, not too long ago, we were aiming to get to the teraflops level. That was exceeded a long time ago. Then the next goal was petaflops, and that one was exceeded. And now our next goal is exaflops, and we are halfway there. This one, basically, its peak uh, its peak performance uh, is around half, depending on how you measure it. It's about half of a of an exaflop. Okay, so this is how the top ranking supercomputer has changed over time. Uh, and this chart uh, was originally perform uh, prepared in 2012. I've looked up the data since then and I've extended the chart. Uh, so the number one rank continues to grow in performance. And this is that last one that I showed you in the previous slide, the top one. The rate of growth, you can say, has slowed down a little bit compared to, so this is the rate of growth over here. It's a little bit flatter. This is the 500 computer on the list. That one has also grown in performance. And I guess some flattening is observed. And this is the total processing power of these 500 computers, that too shows some flattening. So what exactly is parallel processing? So parallelism basically means concurrency, doing more than one thing at a time. Well, if you define parallelism as this, then every computer, every modern computer does things concurrently and is a parallel processor. So for example, uh, a processor that you have in your laptop does many things in parallel. So as for example, a print routine is printing a document that you're printing, some other parts of the computer are doing other things. So this definition is not very helpful. If every computer is a parallel computer, then it's not that helpful. Okay, the sense in which we use the term parallel computing or parallel processors in this course is that multiple agents, hardware units or software processes co collaborate to perform our main computational task. For example, in multiplying two matrices. So if we have two huge matrices that we want to multiply, then different processors will take chunks of that task and perform those chunks and then occasionally exchange data and coordinate in order to solve the larger problem. Uh, breaking a secret code is another example. Uh, deciding on the next chess move in an artificial intelligence application. A lot of things need to be processed to decide on the next chess move. And then the parts, the parallel parts of the computer can share in that load and each does a, a part of it and then we combine the results 
in order. So basically, parallelism occurs in computational tasks. It's not the overlap of processing with I.O. or other, uh, or maybe network access and stuff like that. But the main computational task is run in parallel. OK, so let's now get into some, after this uh, fairly long introduction, let me get into some actual parallel processing ideas uh, through a very simple application. So suppose we want to find the prime numbers in the range 2 to 30. Okay, typically we use this for much larger sets, but let's keep the example small so that things fit on a single slide. Okay, the sieve of Eratosthenes is this idea that says, okay, 2 is a prime. Let's go and eliminate all multiples of 2 from our list because multiples of 2 are not primes. Then take the next element that remains on the list, 3, that's a prime. Let's go and eliminate multiples of 3, such as 9. Uh, well, 6 was already eliminated because it was also a multiple of 2. So 9 will be eliminated, 15 will be eliminated, and so on. Then take the next number, which is 5, which is a prime. Eliminate multiples of 5, such as, let's say, 25. Then 7, eliminate multiples of 7. OK, by the time we get to 7, we can stop. Because if a number ha is divisible by something, so it's a composite number, uh, if a number, um, let's say, n is p times q, one of those p or q should be less than the square root of the number. So if I'm only interested to prime numbers up to 30, square root of 30 is a little bit more than 5. So when I get to 7, I can stop. OK? So this sieve uh, computation is a simple way of finding prime numbers. When I get to this point, all the numbers remaining in my list are primes. OK, so how can we parallelize? How can we execute this program, this algorithm, in parallel? Suppose the numbers are not just to 30, but to 1 million. So we have a lot of numbers to check and a lot of multiples to eliminate. So single processor implementation of this algorithm is represented in this diagram. So we have the current prime, which is 2 initially, and an index that says where in the list we are. So index will be here. And then we go and eliminate multiples of all the multiples of the number pointed to by the index, multiples of 2. So 4 will be eliminated, 6, and so on. Then we move the index to point to the next number, OK? So this is the sequential solution. You can easily write a program that does a reasonable job as long as n is not very large, and it works. So the first parallel implementation is the so-called control parallel implementation. OK, how does this work? First of all, each processor is provided with its private index because it will be working on eliminating multiples of a different prime. So processor 1, processor 2, processor p will have different indices. And then processor 1 will eliminate multiples of 2. Processor 2, let's say, eliminates multiples of 3, and so on. OK, there are some loose ends here. How, how do they know, you know which multiple to work on? Let's ignore those uh, problems for now. Just focus on the source of speed up in this parallel implementation. 
So this is a single processor. It eliminates multiples of two. There are 500. So this is uh, assuming n is a 1,000 in this example. There are about 500 multiples of two. There are about 333 multiples of three that have to be eliminated and so on. So this is how much time it takes. We have to go to 31, which is the square root of 1,000. Okay, it takes 14, 11 time units, where a time unit is the time needed to eliminate one of those multiples. Elimination can occur basically by uh, setting a 0 to 1. So we have a vector uh, of length 1,000 at the beginning. Every element of that vector is 0 because nothing has been eliminated, or is 1. We can go the opposite way. And then as we eliminate a multiple, we change that uh, entry in that vector, element in that vector, from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0. If you have two processors, this is the situation. One processor is working on multiples of 2. It takes 500 time units. Concurrent with that, another processor is working on multiples of 3. Then when this processor is done with multiples of 3, it just moves on and does multiples of 5. And then this one finishes before this one, so it proceeds and tackles multiples of 7, and so on. And it takes 706 time units, about one half of the original. So I used two processors, and I speeded up the computation by a factor of 2. If I use three processors, this will be the situation. Multiples of 2 are eliminated by one processor. Multiple of 3 by the second one. Multiples of 5 by the third one. Then when this one finishes, it proceeds to multiples of 7. And this one takes 499, about, let's say, 500 steps. And this is not quite a third of that because there is some waste. Okay, So the first processor is the one that is holding up. Uh, the second and third one finish earlier. Now, if we go to four processors, if the computational scheme is as I described, four processors will not help because the one processor that is doing the multiples of two will dictate how much time it takes. So there will be no additional speed up for four or five or six processors. So this is control parallel implementation. The next idea is data parallel implementation. Instead of uh, dividing the work by each processor tackling the multiple of a, a different prime, we divide the list into sublist of n over p. So there are n elements. n over p are assigned to processor 1, the next n over p to processor 2, and so on. So processors will be working on sections of this list. And within that section, they will be eliminating multiples of 2, 3, and so on. So the sharing is done in terms of dividing the data. That's why it's called data parallel. Let's assume that square root of n is less than n over p. That's a reasonable assumption. So that all the primes whose multiples need to be eliminated are held by processor 1. Remember, we went up to square root of n. And if that's less than n over p, then all the primes. So basically, p1 will be the leader in this process. It determines that the next prime is 2. Basically, communicates this information to the other processors and say, OK, go ahead and eliminate all multiples of 2. So in parallel, all of them will do that. Then it will say, and they all take the same amount of time because their lists are of the same size. So they have the same number of multiple multiples of twos. And the leader says, go ahead and eliminate all multiples of three. And then they all do that. OK, so this is the data parallel implementation. Now, this communication, in general, has some overhead. 
if you ignore that overhead, if there is very little overhead that you can ignore, then this is perfect parallelization in the sense that no matter how many processors you have, you achieve a speed up equal to the number of processors. Okay, so if you have 10 processors, you have to achieve 10 fold speed. Unfortunately, because this communication has some overhead, you don't quite achieve that. So basically, the amount of computation per processor goes down as you increase the number of processors. Typically, communication overhead goes up. As you have more and more processors, you need more time to communicate between them. And therefore, the solution time, which is the sum of computation time and communication time, will look like this. And therefore, beyond a certain number of processors, we have diminishing returns, and the solution gets worse because we just have too much communication overhead. Okay? So the best solution for this is to keep the number of processors below this. Actually, this itself is not very good because if you take this compared to this point, the improvement in solution is very small and the number of processors has increased substantially. So perhaps some point around here would be the best solution. Okay, so the ideal speed up increases with the number of processors. If there were no communication overhead, the speed up would go linearly, will go up linearly with the number of processors. But the actual speed up drops because of that overhead. And then there's a maximum speed up that you can achieve. And the optimal choice of the number of processors will be somewhere below that optimum. Okay, let me skip the slide in the interest of being able to finish. And this slide, this is basically a general trend of how technology develops uh, for technologies, graphics, networking, risk, parallelism in terms of you know, being started by uh, the government support and then eventually going to the industry and the industry taking it to basically more advanced levels. And this is a more detailed, uh, more examples in this slide. Okay, this slide are originally uh, developed around the year 2000 and it outlined the state of computing power around the year 2000. In the year 2000, we had gigaflops of power in our desktop computers. In fact, Apple Macintosh with G4 processor offered that level of performance. Billion floating point operations per second could be done on a desktop computer. Trillion floating point operations per second could be done by supercomputers that we had in our supercomputer centers. And this is an example. And then petaflops was on the drawing board. In other words, we were working hard to achieve petaflops performance. Each decade, basically, this slide needs to be updated. In 2010, when I updated it, we had teraflops on our desktop, a factor of 1,000 more. We had petaflops in our supercomputer centers. And exaflops was what we, striving, we were striving to achieve research prototypes okay and then as we leave 2020 we are not quite at the level of uh, exaflops in the supercomputer center as I mentioned we are halfway there but it takes probably another year or two to get to exaflops we do have petaflops in our uh, desktop computers so petaflops which was once, uh, you know, in the domain of supercomputers, now has moved to our desktop. And then once we achieve exaflops, zettaflops is the next 
milestone that we will strive for. That's 10 to the 21 floating point operations per second. So this basically is intended, this slide, to impress upon you that every decade or so, computing power, whether we look at desktops or supercomputer center or research projects, increases by a factor of a thousand. Okay, this taxonomy you probably have seen in other courses. This is uh, due to Flynn in the 1960s. He came up with this classification of computer systems that has stuck, you know, it's used widely. In terms of how many instruction streams the computer has, single or multiple, and how many data streams it operates upon, single or multiple, so SISD, this is the way it's pronounced, SISD is basically uniprocessors. The single stream of instructions is executed and it operates on the single stream of data. SIMD, a single instruction stream operates on multiple data streams. This is sometimes called array or vector processing. We'll see examples of this. MIMD, multiple instruction streams executed on multiple data streams. These are multiprocessors or multi-computers. And MISD is a category that has not been used much. That's basically when multiple instruction streams operate on a single data stream. I'll give you an example of that just for completeness. And then later, Johnson expanded this because almost every computer since a couple of decades ago that we built, every high-performance computer falls into this category. Therefore, this classification now loses its power because everything is in this box, pretty much. So Johnson said, okay, MIMD computers can be classified according to uh, whether they use global memory or distributed memory, and whether they use shared variables for communications or they use message passing. Okay, unfortunately, these acronyms cannot be pronounced, like here, SISD, SIMD, MISD, MIMD. Global memory, shared variable. These are shared memory multiprocessors. <coughs> Distributed memory shared variable. This is a distributed shared memory. Distributed memory message passing. These are distributed memory multi-computers. And again, this one category is rarely used. Global memory with message passing. So we'll see examples of various design ideas in these various domains. Okay, over the years, many people have raised objections to the use of parallel processing. Basically, they say, you know, they're, they're naysayers. They say parallel processing cannot be useful because of this, because of this, and so on. All of these have been rebutted over the years, and parallel processing has been very successful. So I leave it up to you to read all of these except the last one. So that you know you're familiar if you encounter in the literature of um, two, three decades ago, you're familiar with these arguments. <coughs> Amdahl's law is one objection that is really valid and we need to pay close attention to. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, you should have seen Amdahl's Law in your basic architecture course, no matter where you have taken it. Amdahl's Law says basically, if we have an application so that we change a fraction of that application, one minus f, to be faster, for example, through parallel processing. This doesn't just apply to parallel processing. And the fraction f is unaffected. In other words, it's run at the original speed. 
So a fraction f runs at the original speed. A fraction 1 minus f runs p times as fast. So that's the speed up. Uh, this may be, say, the number of processors. So we use p processor, and we have perfect speed up. In other words, that, that fraction that is parallelizable, can be run in parallel, runs p times as fast. And the speed up that you can expect is this. If the original running time was 1, if fraction f is unaffected, it still has the same running time. And if fraction 1 minus f runs p times as fast, this will be the speed. And we immediately see from this formula that the speed up cannot exceed p. In other words, if f is 0, then the speed up will be p. And then it cannot also exceed 1 over p. That's if p is infinity, if we use a very large number of processors so that this part that runs in parallel has nearly zero running time, then the speed up will be 1 over f. Okay? So basically, if we plot the speed up as a function of the enhancement factor p for different f values, if f is 0, we have linear speed up, no problem there. If f is 0.1, 0 0.01, then we have a flattening here. And eventually, for very large number of processors, this will become 100, 1 over f. And f is, well, let's say, 0.1. The best we can hope for is a speed up of 10. OK? So this fraction, what Amdahl called the inherently sequential fraction of the task that cannot be speeded up, has a big role to play in how much speed up we can achieve. Because if the fraction is 0.1 and the speed up that you can achieve is 10, well, with 20 processors, you already can achieve a speed up of maybe around 7. When you go to 50 processors, your speed up is maybe, I'm just guessing from this, is maybe 8. So you didn't really gain much in going from 20 to 50 processors. Therefore, you cannot execute such a task with many processors, a highly parallel computation. Okay? So this is a valid objection. Assuming that this fraction unaffected is fixed. In other words, this fraction is 0.1 regardless of what size problem you're tackling. So if you have a matrix multiplication algorithm, okay, that has the fraction 0.1, whether the matrices are 100 by 100, or whether they are 1,000 by 1,000, then this objection would be valid. Okay, in practice, however, this fraction, actually you can, you can do things to reduce this fraction, so it's not a constant number, for larger problems. So maybe for that larger matrix multiplication, it's of being 0.1, it becomes 0 0.03, okay? So if that's the case, then this objection, at least in this form, does not apply, because f is not fixed, okay? So that's basically the way we get around Amdahl's law. Amdahl was a, basically a proponent of using a single processor to achieve high performance instead of parallel processing because he thought that parallel processing is wasteful when you have a significant fraction of the task. So for example, when you're running an operating system, well, an operating system is not very parallelizable because it does basically a whole bunch of control functions rather than computations, numerical computations, okay? But again, we can get around Amdahl's objection by carefully planning our computation so that this f actually reduces as we increase the problem size. OK, the last uh, uh, piece for today's lecture, section 1.6, uh, deals with effectiveness of parallel processing. A number of abstract ideas are formulated in this section and formulas are given in order to basically assess how effective the parallel solution to a particular problem is. So let's start with 
we call a task graph. So each of these circles is a task, a computational task to be performed. So there are 13 such com computational tasks numbered from 1 to 13. These arrows indicate prerequisite structures. So task 1 must be performed to completion before you can start task 2. Two must be performed because before you start task 3. Task 3 and 1 are prerequisite and some external piece of data or something are prerequisites to task 4. You can view this sort of uh, an analogy to taking courses. Okay, so course 1 you can take right away. Uh, but course two, you cannot take until the prerequisite, the one, this course has been satisfied, okay? So if you try to take these courses in minimum possible time, you start by taking one, then you take two in the next quarter, if it's offered, then you take three. Once you have taken three, you are free to take four, five, and eight. You can do that in parallel if you want, in the same quarter, if they're all available and you're capable of taking, okay, and so on. So this basically, um, here I'm assuming unit time tasks for simplicity. Each of these tasks takes a unit time, let's say one second, whatever the unit is, one minute. Okay, so the fastest you can complete this execution of this task graph is determined by its critical path from the first node, beginning node, to the end node. So the critical path goes through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight tasks. So the minimum time you need because of this prerequisite structure is eight time units. There's no way you can finish executing these tasks in fewer than eight time units. Okay, on a single processor system, this task graph requires 13 time units. Remember, these are unit time tasks. So 13 unit time tasks require 13 time units. So T1, the time needed with one processor is 13. The work performed by one processor, the amount of computational work is also 13. The time needed with the large number of processors practically infinite is eight. In other words, that's the best you can do. Okay, so P is the number of processors. WP is work performed by P processors. The reason this WP may be different from W1 is that when you do things in parallel, sometimes you have to do additional work. Uh, for example, overhead, communication overhead, and so on. And sometimes you have to do redundant work in order to parallelize a particular task graph. Okay, so the work performed by P processors can be larger than P1, uh, W1. TP execution time with P processors. T1 is always equal to W1, as we saw here. TP is always less than or equal to WP. If you need to perform W units of work, you can do it in time that is at most equal to WP, but you can, may be able to do it faster. SFP is the speed up, which is how much time a single processor needs compared to the time that P processors need. Efficiency is T1 divided by P times TP, so these are definitions basically. How much time a single processor needs so what is P times TP? Well, this means you're occupying P processors over this time period. So this is the computational resources that you're devoting to this problem. Okay, so if the speed up is equal to P, Sorry, if the speed up is equal to P, T1 over TP is equal to P, then efficiency becomes 1. Okay, R of P is redundancy, how much work the parallel 
processor performs divided by how much work the single processor performs, how much redundant computations or overhead do you have in performing this parallel computation. Utilization is the work performed by P processors divided by P times TP. P times TP, remember as I said here, is the amount of computational resources. You have P processors that are occupied for TP time, but they perform only this much work. So that means during some time steps, they may be idle, not doing useful work, and therefore this is known as utilization. How much of the hardware of these processors are you utilizing um, to do actual work, okay? And the last one, quality, has a weird formula, but there is a way to justify this. I leave it up to you to, to work on this. So quality is sort of an overall measure of, based on the other factors. A T cube of one divided by P, P squared of P, W of P. Why this formula makes sense is for you to discover. Okay, let's take some examples and apply this uh, these formulas to it. So this is the computation. Uh, this is a toy computation, of course. You won't use parallel processing for such a simple <coughs> computation. You're adding 16 numbers. So these are the 16 numbers. You add them pairwise in the first level of this computation. So let's say you use eight processors in parallel to add those pairs of numbers. Then you feed the sum of these two numbers and the sum of these two numbers to this processor. So you need only four processors in the next step. And then two processors and then one processor, then you have the sum here, okay? So this is a parallel computation, a toy parallel computation. Assuming zero time communication. So these communications, so this processor may be the same one that did this one. So there's no communication there, but this processor will be different than this one. If this is the one that did this addition, then it will be different from the one that did this addition. So there will be some communication there. Let's ignore that. Let's say we have zero time. Communication time is so small we can ignore it. Okay. Now, the speed up of this computation, we do things in four time units, whereas a single processor would require 15, or we could say 16, depending on how you do the sum of 16 numbers. You initialize the sum to zero, and then add the 16 numbers, or you initialize the sum to the first number, and then add the other 15 numbers. 15 or 16, doesn't matter. Okay, so 15 time units is reduced to four time units for a speed up of 3.75, or speed up of 4 if you take this to be 16. Redundancy is 1. There are no redundant operations. Efficiency is 47%. Where does that efficiency come from? Okay, let me go back to the previous slide. Efficiency was T1 divided by P times TP. P1 is 15, uh, sorry, T1 is 15. Uh, you're using eight processors over four time units. So essentially you could compute 32 additions because you're using eight processors over four time units. And therefore you're not using the hardware resources very efficiently. Use all eight processors at the beginning, but only four of them here, only two of them here, okay? If you assume unit time communication so that this, the diagonal connections take unit time, the vertical connection take no time because the same processor that did this will do this, will do this. Then the speed up becomes only 2.14 
Redundancy is now 1.47. We are doing extra work because we are doing communication that we did not need in the sequential solution. And the quality, which is a measure of the overall goodness of the solution, was 1.76 up there, and it's only 0.39 down here. Okay, so this gives you an idea why these measures. Uh, your first homework will contain at least one problem dealing with these concepts. Okay, let me end my presentation today by this slide that I developed many years ago. I call it the ABCs of Parallel Processing. Where the A stands for Amdahl's Law. E stands for Brent's Scheduling Theorem. And C stands for Cost Effectiveness Added. Okay, these two we will deal with later, in fact, near the end of the course. But we already know the A part, one third of the big picture, we already know. Amdahl's law is sort of the bad news of parallel computing. It says that sequential overhead will kill you because speed up, which is T1 divided by TP, with the notation I introduced uh, two slides ago is less than or equal to minimum of 1 over f and p. So you cannot exceed p, which is intuitively obvious, but you also cannot exceed 1 over f. For f equal to 0.1, speed up is at plus 10, regardless of how much processing power, peak operations per second, we throw at this problem. As I mentioned, this objection can be overcome by making sure that this f becomes as small as possible, especially as problem size grows. Now, Brent scheduling theorem is the good news of parallel processing, just the opposite of Amdahl. And the cost effectiveness adage is the real news. Okay? So this slide is sort of the big picture of what we take away from this course after we have finished uh, all the topics. All right, let me stop at this point and uh, I will see you in lecture two.